Hello, and thank you for tuning in to my presentation today. My name is Jock McKenzie. I'm the Wetlands Program Manager at Earthwatch Australia and also a Director of Mangrove Watch. And today I'll be talking about how we're countering emissions through community engagement in mangroves via citizen science. Uh, I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I stand today, uh, the Wurundjeri people, and uh, pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. And I'd also like to acknowledge traditional owners all across Australia whose land and sea country uh, includes mangroves and who are working hard to protect and enhance mangrove habitats as they have done for thousands of years. So who is Earthwatch? Earthwatch is a global environmental charity that uh, is all about empowering people to save the natural world through experiential learning via direct engagement in environmental science programs, like via citizen science, uh, working at all levels of society, so from corporate partners to education partners and community science partnerships, um, to generate behavior change so that we can all together have a solution of living in harmony with nature. At Earthwatch, I manage four wetlands programs, all focused primarily on mangroves, as that's my experience and expertise. Uh, and today I'll be talking about three of those programs, the ones down the bottom there, which are primarily blue carbon programs. But firstly, why, why mangroves? What are mangroves? Mangroves are trees of the sea. They're forests that live in the intertidal zone, but in the dynamic interface between the land and marine environments. When I talk about mangroves, I'm also referring to salt marsh, which is the little plants that occur behind the mangrove habitats, um, and together they're called tidal wetlands. And these ecosystems are highly valuable. So despite occupying a small proportion of the Earth's surface, mangroves and tidal wetlands do the heavy lifting when it comes to providing ecosystem services. So if you've eaten a fish or a prawn lately, then there's a little bit of mangrove in you probably, because most of the seafood that ends up on our plate depends on mangroves for part of its life cycle. Mangroves also provide shoreline protection, preventing storm surge and erosion. They filter nutrients and sediments, uh, providing clear water for adjacent coral and seagrass habitats to thrive. And they are habitat for a huge array of critters from insects to charismatic megafauna like crocodiles and sea turtles. And mangroves have intrinsic cultural value forming an important part of land and sea country and providing traditional uh, resources such as fisheries resources. But today I'm here primarily to tell you about the role of mangroves in helping to remove carbon from the atmosphere and how citizen science can help to enhance mangrove carbon storage and prevent mangroves from becoming a carbon sink uh, sorry, from becoming a carbon source instead of a carbon sink. Because mangroves are blue carbon storage. So blue carbon is the carbon that's stored in marine ecosystems and mangroves, being trees of the sea, are part of that blue carbon story. Mangroves store four to 10 times more carbon than other forests, and they can trap it up to 50 times faster. And they can do this because photosynthesis traps carbon in plants' leaves, Mangroves being in tropical zones have really high productivity and because they're living in a salty environment, they have to turn leaves over really rapidly to get rid of the salt. Those leaves fall on the forest floor where they're gobbled up by little crabs and those crabs take those leaves, bury them underground, stick them up on their burrows like wallpaper uh, and those leaves and that carbon stored in those leaves is then buried underground and that's carbon sequestration. Unfortunately, when mangroves die or become degraded or are removed, that carbon is released back to the atmosphere, making mangroves a carbon source. So one of the most effective ways we can prevent carbon emissions and also trap carbon is by protecting mangroves and creating opportunities for mangrove restoration. Now, unfortunately, mangroves, despite being valuable, are also highly vulnerable. Sea level rise, cyclones, changing rainfall patterns through droughts and floods all impact mangroves. And despite our knowledge of the value of mangroves and the risks presented to them by climate change, we're still not very good at managing them. So with all the human pressures plus the natural, natural pressures that mangroves are exposed to, we have reduced ecosystem resilience and the reduced capacity of mangroves to respond to climate change. At a local level, there is limited 
uh, actions that communities can take to prevent climate change. That's a national policy, international policy issue. But what they can do is manage local issues, reduce the local threats like vehicle impacts, cattle grazing, altered hydrology, that then give mangroves the best chance of survival uh, in the face of climate change. And that way, keeping their capacity to store carbon and also enhance carbon storage through new mangrove growth where they might be expanding their sea level rise. So what is the role of citizen science in mangrove conservation and emissions reduction? Well, let's take it back a step. Because mangroves are highly efficient at removing carbon from the atmosphere, companies and governments can invest in blue carbon ecosystem restoration as a carbon offset. But that investment needs to be underpinned by scientific data to know exactly how much carbon can be stored and over what time period. Otherwise, that investment is just a whole lot of hot air. So with citizen science, we can use that to address critical data gaps that currently exist in the blue carbon science. So at the moment, there's not very much long-term data sets of mangrove forest change. There's also not many, uh, not a wide spatial coverage and distribution of mangrove forest study sites. And there's also very few actual mangrove forest standing stock carbon sites. So there's a lot of below ground knowledge um, of how much carbon is stored below ground, but not so much understanding of the forest processes that drive mangrove storage and turnover and sequestration. We also need to ensure that existing mangroves stay intact as habitat loss and degradation can result in carbon emissions. So by engaging people in mangrove citizen science, we can work together to develop local targeted management strategies that can inform restoration and conservation. So working with local communities, we can incorporate local knowledge and ecological knowledge together um, to create better and more effective local solutions. And in doing that, we're, by engaging people in mangrove citizen science, we're increasing community knowledge and inspiring local mangrove champions who can become a voice for the mangroves. So the role of citizen science is twofold, addressing the critical knowledge data gaps and improving local management and conservation. So we have three primary blue carbon projects that help to address both knowledge gaps and empowering local communities. The first one is the Understanding Queensland's Blue Carbon Resource funded by Mitsubishi Development. In this program, we take teams of citizen scientists on Earthwatch expeditions uh, up to the Daintree and Mackay. Uh, and over the past two years, we've engaged 61 citizen scientists in data collection. Uh, in the Daintree, this is the, one of the longest running mangrove studies in the world. So we have sites all across the, the Daintree River where we've tagged trees and measuring trees. And um, that knowledge is then used to understand how mangrove carbon stores in forest, mangrove forests are changing over time. So this, these uh, sites in the Daintree were set up in 1986 by the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And we've then worked with uh, Dr. Norm Dew to continue that process. So this is giving us really important data. So there's some exciting outcomes that are going to be coming out of this project uh, in the near future, showing that actually mangrove forest carbon stores in standing stock biomass matter. It's not just the below ground story, it's about what's happening in above ground forest too. And then in Mackay, we're going back to sites that I was fortunate enough to set up 17 years ago in my first mangrove field study, uh, where mangroves were impacted by a herbicide runoff um, and there was a lot of mangrove dieback as a result. Um, so we're going back to that site, those sites, and looking at how the carbon stores have changed in that time period after this uh, degradation event that, and disturbance event that caused the mangroves to die. So through that information, we've through both these um, programs, there's been nearly 5,000 trees measured and over 55 sites with 49 below ground cores sampled as well. And that would just have been nearly impossible uh, without the help of citizen science. And with that data, we've increased the number and distribution of mangrove standing stock assessments, almost doubled the existing number of sites available. And we've contributed data to the Australian National Greenhouse Accounts uh, for the development of blue carbon uh, emission reduction fund methods. So that data is informing blue carbon modelling at a national policy level. We also have our Protecting Wetlands for the Future program funded by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. This is all about getting students engaged directly in mangrove citizen science. There's lots of mangrove studies already within the 
uh, high school curriculum, but at the moment it's not directed towards any real outcomes. So what we're trying to do is achieve the education outcomes, as well as getting students collecting real data that has real world implications. So we've trained uh, lots of teachers, 86 teachers and 531 students have been involved in mangrove data collection across the uh, Cairns to Gladstone region. Um, and we've developed six lesson plans that can help teachers deliver that mangrove citizen science with five training videos. And the data that the students have collected of the 558 trees that were measured has also been used to inform the blue carbon emission reduction fund methods. So this is students collecting data as part of their high school program that is having national implications in forming national policy. It's also helping to inform local management. I think that's an amazing outcome for citizen science. And the final program is the CAFNET Kansan Far North Queensland Mangrove Watch Program, also funded by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. We've had 300 citizen scientists engaged from the Starkey River north of Cooktown down to Ingham, uh, surveying 10 estuaries using the shoreline video assessment method, as you can see in this picture here. Uh, and from that, we've developed mangrove condition indicators that are being used to be incorporated into the Wet Tropics Healthy Waterways report cards to inform local reef management uh, and to drive management actions to protect mangroves. So now we have an understanding of how con mangrove condition is improving over time and some measure that we can then use to say, are the management um, strategies that we're implementing in these areas effective at improving mangrove habitat condition and their function as a, as a carbon store. So what have we learned from our wetland citizen science programs? Well, as you can see, they've been highly effective at generating community awareness, increasing local knowledge, inspiring local mangrove champions, uh, and generating data that has implications for national policy in terms of carbon storage and also informing local management. So the strengths are that these community science partnerships provide two-way knowledge exchange, particularly combining traditional and Western knowledge where we work with indigenous partners. We have a targeted approach to schools and that are already active community groups that results in greater long-term activity. So it's enduring change. We have high quality data collection and analyses that contributes to both scientific and management outcomes. We have programs that are designed for end user applications so that they're actually, you know, it's not just monitoring for monitoring's sake. We're educating and empowering local mangrove champions to be a voice for coastal ecosystems. And importantly, we're providing opportunities for corporate partnerships that provide increased investment in mangrove conservation and blue carbon. Of course, there are some challenges. Funding to support data analysis is a usual one for any citizen science program, uh, particularly funding the science in citizen science. There are also limited mechanisms to transition citizen science into on-ground action. So there, there's not a real process within local government or state government that, that, that provides an opportunity for transfer of citizen science collected data and community knowledge into on-ground action. So there's a bit of a discontinuity there. Also, it's hard to get uh, good news stories into the news sometimes, so getting that uptake of communications in the media, that there are positive things happening in these communities where there's, there's mangroves that are doing good things to, to protect and restore their mangrove habitats. And of course, we need to be better at uh, engaging with social scientists to capture the broader behaviour change resulting from citizen science engagement. So if you would like to get involved in Mangrove Watch and have your mangroves watched, as our happy little crab friend asked there, would you like your mangroves watched? You can contact us at Earthwatch via email. Drop us a line on our social media pages at Earthwatch Australia. And teachers, if you want to get involved in the Protecting Wetlands for the Future program, you can download the Mangrove Watch Citizen Science Lesson Plans from Cool Australia. Thank you for listening and uh, thank you very much to our funders, Mitsubishi Development and Great Barrier Reef Foundation for supporting these wonderful programs. And of course, thank you to all the amazing citizen scientists out there who have helped create these amazing data outputs.